Hey everyone, a very good morning to all of you. Myself Neha Gupta, your mentor for current affairs. So I welcome you all in this video. Let's begin the current affairs that can be of use for your RBS ABN NABARD examinations. But before that, guys, let me inform you that the PDF of this session is completely free of cost, and you can download it from the Telegram channel. The link is in description below. You can visit our website currentaffairs.anujindal.in to download the Spotlight monthly magazine as well. So on that note, let's begin with the first question of the day. Which two new countries have allowed a visa-free entry to the Indian passport holders as per the Henley Passport Index 2022? So guys, the right answer here is option A, Oman and Armenia. Recently, this Henley Passport Index has been released for the quarter first of this year. I hope that you are aware that this index is released for the four quarters of the year and in each quarter, it gives the rankings to the countries on the basis of the visa-free entry that the country is allowed in the number of other countries. Okay, So on the basis of that, it has ranked India at the 83rd position because India or the Indian passport holders are allowed a visa-free entry in 60 countries. And last year, this number was 58. 58 countries allowed the Indian passport holders a visa-free entry. But this year, Oman and Armenia have also given their assent that the Indian passport holders can, can visit their country without a prior visa. They can get the visa on arrival here also. So this has increased the number to 80 and sorry, to 60 and improved India's ranking to 80. Third. Now, where are these country lo countries located? So, let me show you the location. So, here is Oman and this is the Gulf of Oman. I hope that you are aware. India is here and this is uh, Armenia. Okay. So, all of these, uh, these two nations have allowed the entry. Can you guys tell me the capitals of Oman and Armenia in the comment section below? So, this is your first question of the day. Now, Japan and Singapore have topped this index. They have been... Uh, uh, they have been ranking at the first position in this index for many quarters now. Okay, so 192 countries allow a visa-free entry or the visa of visa on arrival facility to the Jap Japanese and Singaporean passport holders. Second position is occupied by Germany and South Korea. Finland, Italy, Luxembourg, and Spain are at the third position with a score of 189. US and UK are at the sixth position. Now the reason behind mentioning these two countries is that these two countries have improved their position in this index. So, right now they are uh, ranked at the 6th position as you can see. Now, let's discuss facts related to India. So, 83rd is India's ranking. Last year, it was 19th. But due to the Oman and Armenia's stance, it has improved to 83rd. The score of India last year was 58. Now, it has improved to 60. Now, India is sharing this ranking with Sao Tong and Principe, which is an island country in the Central Africa. Okay, uh, I have already told you this fact that 60 countries allow visa-free entry. Oman and Armenia are the new additions. Um, in the fourth quarter, that is the last uh, last uh, index, 58 destinations allowed the visa-free entry. Now, the stacking fact here is that despite uh, 60 countries allowing Indian passport holders a visa-free entry or visa on arrival entry, still the uh, increment in the score of India in the last decade is just by only 7 points. In 2011, the score of India was 53 and in 2022, it is 60. That means 10 years back, 53 countries allowed India uh, a visa-free entry and now it has increased to 60. This shows a clear uh, need for an improvement in the soft power of India so that more and more uh, visa-free entry, more and more countries will allow this facility to the Indian passport holders, which also shows a belief or trust of those countries in the citizens of India in the uh, in the diplomacy of India. Okay, so this is the dire need of the R. Now there are certain additional facts from this report. Travel apartheid. I hope that you have uh, read the description of this video as well. So in the description, I have mentioned that in this video you are going to learn a, a bit of new terms like the travel apartheid. So what is this travel apartheid? So I will come to that, but first let me give you a glimpse of the facts related to this uh, Henley Passport Index. So the tenure of this index is the first quarter. I have already told you this fact so many times. Uh, bottom is Afghanistan and Iraq, and this index was launched in 2006. It assesses 199 passports. Okay, basically the countries. Uh, the basis of this index is the data from the International Air Transport Association. So do remember this point is important. Now let's discuss what travel apartheid is. So this year's report has 
witnessed a wide gap in the global north and the global south now what is this gap what is the global north what is the global south i hope that these questions are springing up in your mind so let me first clarify that global north is the is the basically grouping of the countries that are developed whereas the global south is the grouping of the countries that are developing or underdeveloped so india is also a part of the global south okay so the it was seen in this index that the more that the countries in the global north are having more and more countries that are allowing them the visa free facility but the countries in the global south and that to the all the countries from the african continent so it is seen that those countries are not getting this facility in many countries so this was termed as the travel apartheid by this report however it is not evidently mentioned by at by any other source apart from this report and it is also an opinion made by this report that it looks like a travel apartheid it is not that the countries are practicing it deliberately uk is deliberately not giving the access visa free access to any african passport holder or any country that is not deliberate that is a trend that is observed by this report and that trend has been termed as travel apartheid i hope that this is now clear to you so that is all about this first term so here you can see that oh, sweden and us like countries are getting a uh, visa free entry or visa on arrival entry in more than 180 destinations whereas countries from the african region like uh, angola cameroon laos uh, laos is in asia um, they are getting entry only uh, in 50 countries okay about 50 countries so this is also a very uh, starking difference among the glo global north and the global south now apart from this this report also mentions about a new initiative of india and that is uh, the e passports indian government is planning to launch the e passports basically implement the e passports as soon as possible because these e passports have a chip that contains the bio uh, bi biological uh, details of the passport holder so plus the chip also has the digital security feature basically a digital signature of the country so the digital signature is unique for each and every country so this makes the passport all the more secure and this will reduce the uh, uh, this will reduce the duplication of fraud passports uh, in the country okay so this is a step towards strengthening the passport security of india and this will definitely give a push to indian passport holders to get visa free entry and visa on arrival facility in many more countries let's see what is what would be india's ranking in the next index next quarters index uh, apart from this you need to know this fact also that prior to the covid pandemic in 2019 india was the third largest issuer of passports with 12.8 million passports okay <coughs> china and us were at the first second position okay next question is whose autobiography is titled as indomitable here the right answer is arundhati bhattacharya she was the former chairperson of the state bank of india who has been appointed as a ceo of adani power sher singh b khyalia is the right answer what is the gdp forecast for india for 2021 to 2022 for city grouping uh, by city grouping so here the right answer is 9% so recently in the wake of the third wave of covid 19 three uh, three agencies have reduced india's gdp forecast for the current year and those agencies are city grouping india ratings and icici bank so city group has forecasted 9% gdp growth rate uh, india ratings has reduced the gdp growth rate to 9.3% whereas icici bank forecasted a 9.6% gdp growth rate now all of these uh, uh, all of these gdp forecast have been downgraded because of the uh, third wave of the covid pandemic and also because of the first estimate of the national income that was released by the nso in this month only okay so in that estimate the nso itself has predicted a 9.2% gdp growth rate for the current year which is down from the growth rate that is forecasted by rbi that is 9.5% so nso which is the indigenous organization of india that forecast the gdp growth rate at the same time analyzes the economic situation that is also believing a downgrade in the gdp forecast of india then it is very obvious for the other agencies to downgrade it okay so in light of this development these organizations have reduced india's gdp forecast now i hope that you have covered the first advance estimate of the national income by nso i have covered it in the daily current affairs videos uh, also okay so if you haven't covered it from there the you can cover it from the daily pdfs as well moving ahead with which indian company has nepal power exchange limited signed a trading agreement to sell electricity produced by it to india 
so guys i would say that this is not so important question but at the same time we cannot afford to ignore such kind of a question because we have seen this trend right in the past years examinations that uh, whenever the examiners run out of the very logical questions they tend to go to such kinds of questions therefore you need not to ignore such questions here the right answer is money current power limited so basically through this uh, agreement the companies in nepal will generate electricity and they will uh, they will uh, give electricity supply electricity to india via this company now here two questions should arise in your mind first why is india procuring electricity from a country like nepal which is very much lower in com uh, lower in electricity generation in comparison to india secondly does india really need electricity that much that it is procuring it from nepal so here guys the answer is to answer to the both questions is that it is in favor of nepal in order to develop the neighboring countries the land share, land border sharing countries of india like nepal bhutan sri lanka sri lanka does not share the land border but the neighboring countries the sense was the neighboring countries so india does not only give them grant to develop their uh, infrastructure but at the same time it also procures products that it does not really need that much but in order to give a boost to the economy of the other side india procures such goods like electricity the electricity the example is in front of us so this is going to benefit the ne nepal's economy because here you can see that the maximum uh, electricity the maximum capacity that indian companies would procure the manikaran limited would procure is 500 megawatt okay so this is not very um, this is not a very huge quantity that india is procuring so this is clearly in the favor of nepal this reminds me of the gujral doctrine so gujral was the prime minister in the gujral was one of uh, the former prime minister of india who gave the gujral doctrine to maintain the foreign policy of india can you guys tell me what are the five principles of the gujral doctrine now next question is the global economy is expected to be dash percent smaller by 2024 than it would have been without the pandemic as per the 17th edition of the global risk report 2022 so here the right answer is 2.3% so clearly this statement is very very important because it is stating that if the pandemic had not happened then the global economy would be up by 2.3% than it would be in 2024 so now the pandemic has re reduced the world's capacity the economic capacity by 2.3% so guys this figure is very important do remember this figure now before telling you the details of this report let me clarify this thing that this report divides the risks into five uh, five uh, dimensions or five parameters we can say uh, economic environmental social technological and geopolitical okay so this global risks report this is the 17th edition of this report this is published by the world economic forum and this report tells us the risks that are facing the uh, human uh, the humans and the entire globe basically the risks that are there for the people and the environment from the near term that is the upcoming two years till a decade till the long term so it encompasses a tenure of 0 to 10 years from this point of time till the 10 years ahead what are the risks that the world might face in the near future that is uh, that is uh, stated by this global risk report so one threat i have already told you one risk that the economies uh, the world economy's capacity has been reduced by 2.3% second is that the and it is very present issue that is the commodity prices inflation and debt all of these are rising in both developing and the developed world and this might lead to economic instability in many countries by the year 2024 developing countries excluding china will have fallen 5.5% below their pre pandemic expected gdp growth while advanced economies will have surpassed it by 0.9% so here the global economic gap will widen so on the one hand we have the developing countries that will face their economic potential downgraded by 5.5% on the other hand the developed countries will face will see a rise in their economic potential by 0.9% and this will definitely lead to a huge economic uh, 
इनस्टेबिलिटी और इनइक्वालिटी एंड दिस इकोनॉमिक इनइक्वालिटी विल डेफिनेटली गिव राइज टू इकोनॉमिक टू बॉर्डर सिचुएशन लाइक इट विल ऑल्सो क्रिएट इनस्टेबिलिटी विद इन द बॉर्डर एट द सेम टाइम अक्रॉस द बॉर्डर लाइक आई विल गिव यू एन एग्जाम्पल इन म्यांमार इन बांग्लादेश नेपाल भूटान सो दीज इन दीज कंट्रीज वेन द पीपल डू नॉट फाइंड लाइवलीहुड अपॉर्चुनिटीज दे ट्रेवल टू इंडिया दिस लीड्स टू माइग्रेशन प्रॉब्लम इमिग्रेशन प्रॉब्लम इन इंडिया सिमिलर इज द केस विद यूएस वेन एवर द पीपल हु आर टैलेंटेड ऑफकोर्स हु डू नॉट फाइंड इनफ इकोनॉमिक अपॉर्चुनिटीज पर्टिकुलरली बिकॉज द कंट्री दैट आर दैट दे आर लिविंग इन इज नॉट इकोनॉमिकली वाइब्रेंट इन कंपेरिजन टू यू एस बिकॉज ऑफ द इकोनॉमिक गैप दैट दीज कंट्रीज आर हैविंग इनकम गैप दैट दीज कंट्रीज आर हैविंग दीज पीपल माइग्रेट टू यू एस दिस लीड्स टू द ब्रेन ब्रेन प्रॉब्लम एट द सेम टाइम दिस लीड्स टू द इमिग्रेशन प्रॉब्लम इन द डेवलप वर्ल्ड बट एट द सेम टाइम इट ऑल्सो लीड्स टू दी बॉर्डर टेंशन इफ यू लुक एट द बॉर्डर टेंशन बिटवीन यू एस एंड मैक्सिको ओके सो दैट इज ऑल्सो पर्टिकुलरली बिकॉज ऑफ द लाइवलीहुड अपॉर्चुनिटीज बिकॉज ऑफ द इनकम Uh, gap between the us and mexico okay so what this report has pointed out from this statement here is that this economic inequality will definitely lead to border tensions it will prevent the countries from collaborating for wider issues like climate change if the countries are themselves focused on their own economic inequalities on their own small scale uh, conflicts then they will never cohere with each other for larger goals like combating the climate change combating the cyber risks combating the terrorism etc etc so all of these points are uh, here highlighted by this single statement all of these are the implications of the widened global income gap okay so i hope that this much is clear to you now guys all the questions for the day have ended now it is time for the gk factory section so i have taken up the global risks report for the gk factory section only now the report uh, the part of the report that is important from your examination point of view i have already explained that much in the question itself now i am going to dwell into the details of this report first of all because the devil is in the details when you understand this report in detail you your horizon will widen you will be able to understand what kind of risks uh does the world face in the near uh, to the long term future at the same time it will help you in frame your esi answers because i have already told you that the this are divided di divided into five dimensions like social environmental eco economic then your technological then your geopolitical so if you have any answer on blockchain cryptocurrency artificial intelligence machine learning etc etc so what kind of threats does the world face that is covered in the technological domain which is going to be explained in the gk factory section okay that might not be asked from you in your phase 1 current affairs that that's why i have restricted myself from explaining it in the prior session okay uh, in the prior uh, explanation next is the economic consequence or the economic threats that the world may face so again this is uh, important i have already explained the most important uh, percentage that this report has mentioned for uh, for the examination then the environmental threat so climate change is one uh, one of the most uh, dangerous issues that the world face so if any question comes on the biodiversity loss if any question comes on the climate change or related to climate change etc so you can cite this report also and from the from your understanding of this report you can frame your answer really well then the so societal concerns the loss of uh, social cohesion the livelihood crisis the uh, the infectious diseases spread all of these uh, all of these sub points are divided into the societal risk that the world face so if any question comes on any of these issues in your esi paper then obviously you will be able to answer it from the understanding that you may develop during the course of the gk factory so let's begin first of all guys let me zoom it out for you now now i hope that these numbers are visible okay so first uh, point here Uh, is that six percent is the vaccination rate in poorest fifty two countries? So basically, this is an overview of the present situation and what kind of risks does this present situation arise? This is something that has been left for you to interpret. Okay, ninety seven percent is the public debt to GDP uh, in twenty twenty. So this is again very huge. Fifty one million increase in extreme poverty projection. Basically. Fifty one million more people will be put into uh, extreme poverty. One ninety seven countries have aligned themselves to the Glasgow Climate Pact. So this is the COP twenty six agreement or the uh, COP twenty six announcements made by the countries. Eighty four percent of the exports uh, are concerned about the world. So this is a very insignificant number, but these four numbers are important from exam point of view as well. Now, guys, I have already told you that the report categorizes the risks into five. 
categories and out of these five categories the top 10 risks that the world may face in the coming 10 years are mentioned here the first one is the climate action failure the second one is extreme weather biodiversity loss so all of these three major concerns that would arise in the next 10 years are related to climate only okay so climate is one major um, one uh, major sector that needs our attention Social cohesion erosion, that is another issue. This will also have a bearing on the mental health of the people. So again, this will help. Now, the reduction in the social cohesion is not particularly due to the COVID pandemic. Many of you might think that due to COVID, people are separated. They, uh, are, uh, they are refraining themselves from contacting the other person. That is not the only cause. That is a cause, but not the only cause for the loss of social cohesion. Okay, now take the example of India here. Social cohesion erosion. It refers to uh, the situation when the people living within a nation deny to cooperate with each other for the co common prosperity. Now here we are facing a loss of social cohesion because of the communalism that is arising. Okay, I'm not saying that is happening at a large scale. Okay, right now it might be in very small manifestations, but however small it is, it is happening. Next is livelihood crisis. So Afghanistan is the best example of it. So, uh, livelihood crisis not only in one country, but in many regions of the world in the coming next years, livelihood crisis is going to become a pressing issue. Then infectious diseases. So, COVID is the prime example of it. Okay, human environment damage, natural resource crisis, debt crisis, uh, geoeconomic confrontations. So, these are the other uh, risks that are uh, there that are looming over the world and here these risks are not only uh, relevant for one country let's say India no they are the global risks that are looming over the countries okay so recently I hope that you are aware of the Ukraine Russia tensions so that is also an example of geoeconomic uh, confrontation geopolitical confrontation I should say more precisely okay so now the, this slides divides the risk on the basis of tenure. In the coming two years, what are the most critical risks that we can face? In the medium term, from two to five years, what are the risks that the world may face? And in the long term, that is five to ten years, what are the risks that the world may face? Okay, so I'm going to discuss this one because the other two are uh, very similar to this one. Majority of the risks have been uh, taken from here only. Okay, so very first risk. The very extreme risk, the very critical threat is the extreme weather. Livelihood crisis is the next. Climate action failure is again. <coughs> Social cohesion, infectious diseases spread, mental health deterioration, cyber security failure, debt crisis. Uh, uh, now from the debt crisis, you should be aware of the fact, as I have told you in the very first slide also, that the debt crisis has increased in many countries. It is 97%. The public debt to GDP uh, is 97% has reached this high level. In India, as of March 2021, the external debt of India stood at five over 500 billion. This is over 500 billion. And this is approximately 21.1% of India's GDP. And this is huge, guys. Okay, 21.1% of India's GDP is only for the external debt that India has raised. So, uh, in light of this thing, debt crisis is a very pressing issue, particularly for India also. Next is digital inequality. Now, this uh, is again very evident in many parts of the world. Okay, now digital inequality, say, uh, I'm remembering a report that is ASA report annual status of education report released by the Pratham NGO. So this report also mentions that the children who have a better access to the digital in, uh, to the digital sources are performing well in comparison to the children who do not have that access. So this inaccessibility is, leg is, in, is pushing these children who have a lesser access uh, far behind than the children who have access. So this is a very basic example of the digital inequalities manifestation in pushing the various sectors behind. Okay. Apart from this, digital inequality is also hampering the growth in financial inclusion as well. So you need to study how digital inequality is pushing the society from growing, particularly in this era when we are living in the fourth industrial revolution that is completely structured on the digital revolution. Okay. Next is the asset bubble burst. So this is something that many uh, financial experts constantly uh, warn the world of. Okay. So if you see the medium term risks, they are primarily taken from the uh, near term risk like the cl uh, climate action failure, extreme weather, social cohesion, erosion, livelihood crisis, debt crisis. 
then we have cyber security failure biodiversity loss asset bubble burst human environmental damage geoeconomic confrontation so in the coming five years these might be the uh, risks that the world may face and uh, in the long term in the 5 to 10 years climate action failure extreme weather biodiversity loss natural resource crisis human and envi human environmental damage so here you can see clearly the top five risks in the long term are completely from the environmental domain next is so uh, social cohesion erosion involuntary migration and you need to know that migration is happening because of two reasons one is the climate change and other one is conflict okay so these two reasons are uh, leading to involuntary migration that needs to stop for the countries to grow adverse tech advances like the cyber attacks cyber threats and geoeconomic confrontations geopolitical resource contestation and the prime example of this of this is china which uh, asserts its right on the south china sea particularly of the resources that are there in the south china sea okay now guys this is the list of the five uh, domains uh, the sub uh, threats that are there sub categories of the threats that are there in the five domains obviously you don't have to memorize those categories which are mentioned here it is just for your information purpose that the debt crisis or the asset bubble burst comprise of the economic domain then the biodiversity loss climate action failure extreme weather is a part of environmental uh, domain then the uh, collapse of multilateral uh, institution fracture of interstate relations geoeconomic confrontations geopolitical con contestations all of these are part of geopolitical domain and the infectious diseases erosion of social cohesion that we have just read are part of the societal concerns and uh, digital inequality digital power concentration are part of the technological domain apart from the other uh, sub domains that are mentioned here so you can just go through them on your own and you will get the pdf Okay, so now that was the uh, very uh, prima facie uh, explanation of this report. Okay, the overview of this report. Now you need to understand the major pressing issues that this report has highlighted. Basically, this report is divided into these six chapters. Okay, now the entire report is divided into six chapters, and these six chapters are themselves important. Like climate change is there, and another one is cyber attack. Then the third one is migration, space, and COVID nineteen. So I'm quickly going through all of these in a very crisp manner so that you can understand. What kind of risk uh, or what is the intensity of the risk? Okay, so let's discuss the climate change first. So, this report, the Global Risk Report 2022, points out that in the best optimistic scenario, the maximum temperature by 2100 would be 1.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, the target is 2 degrees Celsius under the Paris Agreement, and the efforts should be to contain it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if all the commitments are uh, fulfilled by the countries all the ndcs are fulfilled then in the best possible scenario this would be the case okay 1.8 degree celsius would be the um, would be the global temperature which we all know that it is very a utopian uh, scenario okay it is next to impossible because we know that majority of the countries are not going to fulfill their obligations however we do not know what is there in the uh, in the womb of the time what will happen we do not know maybe the countries will oblige by their um, by their commitments and india also has made a commitment of becoming a net zero country by 2070 obtaining 50 percent of the energy from the renewable resources so let's see what is going to happen in the future but as far as the report is concerned in the present time so it is 1.8 degree celsius 130 uh, trillion us dollar is the committed private capital for the carbon neutrality so guys this is again an important statement or uh, the figure is important 40 million jobs created through reskilling in renewable sector by 2050 so again this is important top five environmental risks lead the way in the long term concerns according to the grps the global risk perception service respondents so this is a very uh, non in, in, uh, unimportant statement you can completely ignore it now guys this is important the key pledges made at the cop26 of unfccc that happened in glasgow scotland last year so india pledged to become net zero 27 by 2070 and uh, obtain 50 percent of the electricity from uh, 20, uh, from the renewable resources by 2030 46 countries pledged to transition from coal to clean power by 2040 again this is a very important number all the four points here are very very important if you memorize these points this will definitely help you in framing your answers really well at the same time these can become the direct objective questions in your phase one also so 104 countries pledged to a 30 percent cut in methane emissions by 2030 methane accounts for 30 percent of the historical global warming okay 
so this is important global methane pledge i hope that you all are aware of the pledge that aims to reduce the methane can you guys tell me the countries that initiated the global methane pledge in the comment section below next point here is 141 countries that account for 91% of the world's forest pledged to end deforestation by 2030 again important okay so that was about the climate pledges that were made at the cop26 and this is about the climate change now you will better understand it when you will understand this entire picture that i have taken from the report directly okay so we are here at 1.2 degree celsius in 2021 okay so it was the fifth hottest year on record 2021 now guys this is the target this is the situation if these conditions are fulfilled and this is the situation when no obligation by any country is fulfilled so what this report is what this picture is stating here is that by 2100 if all the countries uh, are fulfilling their pledges then all in the best case scenario if all the countries are uh, are obliging their pledges particularly in terms of ndcs and lts the uh, short term goals that they have set then the maximum temperature by 2100 would be 1.8 degree celsius and the target was 1.5 degree celsius okay but if no uh, fulfillment was there if only half of the ndcs are fulfilled by the countries then 2.4 degree celsius would be the temperature so this is the target this is the actual or the estimated temperature that would happen and this is the worst case scenario okay you can take it as the worst case scenario the top one now if the countries are going as per their current policies then by the 2100 year the temperature would be 2.7 degree celsius which was which will uh, really melt the poles then 2030 targets if the 2030 targets are implemented then the temperature would reach 2.4 degree celsius however the target is 1.9 degree celsius but in the worst case scenario it may reach 3.0 degree celsius okay in the best case scenario it will reach 1.9 degree celsius in the worst case 3 degree celsius and if the pledges are fulfilled the milestones of the 2030 are achieved then 2.4 degree celsius would be the temperature long term pledges <coughs> and 2030 targets are fulfilled then the worst case in in the worst case scenario the temperature would be 2.6 degree celsius in the best scenario it would be 1.7 degree celsius however the estimated temperature is 2.1 degree celsius and in the optimistic scenario okay best case scenario when full implementation of all announced net zero targets are achieved then in the best case scenario the temperature would be 1.5 degree celsius in the worst case scenario the temperature would rise to 2.4 degree celsius however the estimate is 1.8 degree celsius okay so we can clearly assume that which one would be the uh, reality of india which one of these four blocks would become the reality of india at present however future is unknown so at this point of time we can only predict that uh, it may happen that we will either be at this scenario or at this scenario okay however this report states and we do not know what will happen so if all the countries fulfill their net zero obligations then it may happen that by 2100 the temperature is 1.8 degree celsius so let's hope for the best so guys that was about the climate change i hope that you uh, are you have understood it well next is the cyber attack okay so in the year 2030 435% increase was seen in the ransomware okay 3 million gap is there in cyber professionals worldwide so uh, the e-commerce industry by the year 2024 is expected to increase to us dollar 800 billion and 95% cyber security issues are related to human error are uh, cyber security issues traced to the human error so here what are these statements that are important from your exam point of view this the need of the cyber security personnel okay the professionals that are needed in the cyber sphere next is the e-commerce segment it is expected to increase by us dollar 800 billion by 2024 only basically the entire digital commerce industry would be worth 8 dollar 800 us dollar billion and 95% of the cyber issues are traced to the human error this is not a very important point this again is not a very important point but these two points are important guys moving ahead migration so climate change conflict and political instability are the two most important reasons here 200 million projected climate refugees would be there by 2050 again uh, an important uh, point here and this also highlights the need for not only improving the situation in the in terms of climate change but at the same time working for the immigration working on migration also okay 
25% uh, remittance to GDP in El Salvador and Honduras like countries. So this is again a impo non-important point because nobody is going to ask you about these two countries particularly. If it would be India, then they might have asked you this thing, but nobody is going to ask you about El Salvador and Honduras. 9% decline in FDI to low income countries in 2021. This was guys due to the COVID pandemic as well. Okay, not only to the migration, but this was also related to the COVID pandemic. 4,800 estimated migrants perished or missing in 2021. So this is a very striking fact. So this is about migration. And guys, this number is very important. 200 million projected climate refugees by 2020, by 2050. So do remember this number. Now, crowding and competition in space. So this is another chapter of this uh, report, which I found the most, uh, most interesting at the same time, most important. So by 2030, five governments are expected to uh, develop their own space stations. Okay. I hope that you know that China has already developed its space station that is already there in the space. 70,000 estimated number of satellites to launch in the coming, coming de uh, decade by 2030. 70,000 new satellites will be launched. 28 nations with domestic space regulation. Now, I hope that you are understanding the uh, intensity of this thing. Space regulations by 28 nations. Now, we are uh, we are fighting for the sovereignty in the space as well, in the space assets as well. Okay, 1 million estimated number of debris species, 1 centimeter and larger. So, this is again a very huge, uh, I should say, this clearly shows the deterioration, the degradation of the humans, the greed of the humans, that we are not satisfied with the earth, the money that the countries are spending for the space, if they would use that money to reinvigorate the earth, to rejuvenate the environment of the earth, then it would become again a heaven-like place for us. But still, we do not need to improve the earth, we need to fight for space so that we can again uh, colonize the other planets. So that's the fight. Yes, we are uh, fighting for col colonizing the other planets. Let's see who will be successful in it. US has already spearheaded this race with Elon Musk planning to develop a uh, city on Mars and he's already trying to do that. He's already working on that. Uh, we do not know what he will do. Charismatic man. Now here, I came across a very interesting term, which is Kessler effect. So in a very brief or uh, in a very simple term, Kessler effect refers to the collision of the space satellites with each other. And these, this collision creates a cascading impact that leads other um, satellites in the lower Earth orbit to collide with each other. So they basically one collision is leading to another collision. That's the Kessler effect. Now this Kessler effect was first identified by the Donald Kessler in 1978. And this is talking about the satellite and the debris in the low, low Earth orbit, uh, which is really high enough that basically let me read it out for you. So this describes the Kessler effect describes a scenario where the density of objects, the satellites and the debris in the low Earth or orbit is high enough that collisions between objects could cause a cascade in which each collision generates space debris that increases the likelihood of further collisions and an exponential growth of debris. Okay, so that is Kessler effect. Obviously, when collision is there between the satellites or the uh, artificial satellites that we have sent to the lower Earth orbit, then that will create debris. So further debris will be created that may, that may collide with another satellite or any uh, uh, any useful asset of the countries in the space. One implication is that the distribution of debris in orbit could render space activities and use of satellites in specific orbital ranges difficult for many generations. Obviously, if debris is increased to an exponential level, then the satellites won't be able to function properly. So that's the Kessler effect that I found really interesting. How did you like this fact? How much did you like this fact? Who mentioned it in the comment section below? Now, this is again, uh, this is an extra uh, information that I am giving you. So, Kessler collapse, I have already told you that if the space debris is increased, then it's, it will further lead to more collisions. That's Kessler uh, impact and it will definitely, uh, uh, definitely diminish the capacity of the satellites. Next is solar disruption. So, if any kind of solar storm is there in the in the space, then definitely it will have a impact on the satellite functioning. And if the satellites are not going to function properly, it will have a bearing on the countries. Next is property in space. So this is the risk that I was talking about for obtaining the space assets for imperial uh, for colonizing the space assets. So it's the rush again. What would be the what would be the consequence of this? This is something to be seen. So this is uh, an additional information, guys. You need not to memorize any of these facts. 
but this is important the top five risks that india face fracture of the interstate relations okay that is the geopolitical relations might uh, may get uh, hampered debt crisis in large economies then widespread youth dis disillusionment failure of technology governance digital inequality so these are the top five risks for india do remember these risks that india face now here i would like to end this session for today i hope that you have enjoyed the session and if you have then do not forget to subscribe the channel hit the bell notification thank you so much guys for watching the video